How's it going, family? This is Pastor Snell. Listen, the service just finished and we had a high time in Zion. The Spirit of the Lord was with us as we begin a new teaching series entitled The Construction Zone. We're going to be walking through the book of Nehemiah and we're going to be all experiencing a rebuild. Today's message was a critical one entitled Prayer Changes More Than Things. You're going to be seeing how prayer makes the difference. It is the secret sauce for the inner life. So do me a favor. Don't watch this by yourself. Call a family member, get a coworker, get a friend as we go into the word. And remember, prayer changes more than things. Um, today, friends, as we get into the word, we're beginning in the month of March and perhaps through the first Sabbath in April, a new teaching series called The Construction Zone. And what we're gonna be doing over the next several weeks is we're gonna be walking through the book of Nehemiah, and we're gonna be looking at their journey of faith as God used them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And I believe that perhaps there are some of us that need to go through a rebuilding of sorts so that there are some that need to rebuild spiritual walls. Some may need to rebuild some relational walls. Some may need to rebuild the defenses around your faith. And so I need you to know that we're going to spend the next few weeks in the construction zone as the Lord grows and builds us uh, to the place that he would have us to be. And so today, friends, we want to go ahead and jump into the word. Is that all right? And so go ahead and stand to me, stand with me to your feet as we go to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to begin together at verse number 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to begin together at verse number 1. When you get there, say, Pastor, I'm there. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to begin together at verse number 1. Let me just ask real quick, how many of us actually need a word from the Lord today? No, no, some of y'all look like y'all just want a word from the Lord. How many of us need a word from the Lord today? Amen. I want to aim this right at those who have a need today. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 1, and this in some ways could be considered a bridge sermon. It is a launching pad into some larger motifs that we'll get into in the next few weeks. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Shislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of the brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. And I was what? Fasting and what? praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess what? the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are what? Unfaithful. I will scatter you amongst the nations. But if you do what? Return to me and keep my commandments and do them. Though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, 
let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servants, what? Prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Today, saints, for just a little while, I want to talk to you under the subject, prayer changes more than things. Prayer changes more than things. Let us pray together today. Father, we need your spirit today. I pray that your spirit would create such a swell in this space that it smothers all rivaling principalities. Father, I'm praying that faith would be multiplied exponentially in the hearing of the word. And Lord, would you do a decluttering work in this moment? For many of us, our souls are cluttered by worries and stresses and concerns and anxieties Lord, would you sweep our souls clean in this moment that we might be able to hear what it is that you have to say to the church. So please, Lord, would you hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard. And at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let those who believe say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, talking under the subject that prayer changes more than things. You know, friends, in the late 1700s, the French armies of Napoleon drew near a small town in the country of Austria. This little town had neither the weapons, the population, or the militia to withstand this attack. And so as the armies drew near this town, the town leaders conceded defeat because they realized that they could not fight on this plain. But knowing that they could not defeat them in battle, they called the people together where they began to call upon God for divine help. Gathered there in church, they fiercely began to pray to God for divine aid. They invited the rest of the town for a municipal prayer meeting. And so they fiercely began to ring the church bells as an invitation for the townspeople to come and pray. The church bells could be heard for miles outside of the city. And as the French army began to draw near and they heard the sound of the church bells, they immediately began to retreat. You see, they assumed that the ringing of the bells was an announcement that the Austrian army or cavalry had arrived. They immediately began to flee because they were not anticipating a real battle. And the little town in Austria became known as the town that was saved by the power of prayer. And friends, I've come to believe that this story illustrates a more powerful and critical truth because too often we try to fight battles on a plane that we cannot experience victory. You see, we tend to make a distinction between a spiritual battle and an earthly battle. We see this battle as spiritual and that one as financial or medical or relational when the truth is that there are only spiritual battles that show up on your job, in your home, and sometimes with your money. And the reason, friends, that Satan doesn't want you to know what type of battle you're fighting is so that you don't know what type of weapon you need to use. Can I suggest, friends, that oftentimes we are defeated because we are fighting spiritual battles with earthly weapons? 
But I believe, friends, that when we begin to turn to God in all things and for all things, it becomes clear that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. I See, I want to simply proffer today that we would be greater and mightier. Our victories would be more consistent if we were more prayerful in all things. You see, the believer has to recap capture the truth that God is our source. Do I have anybody that believes that God is our provider, that God is our protector, that God is our supplier, that God is our strength and our portion, and there's never a time where we ought to operate autonomously or separately from him. In fact, I've stopped by to let some distressed soul know today that the battle you're fighting today is not yours, but that battle belongs to the Lord. In fact, I need somebody to know that your outcomes will never change until your weaponry or artillery does. And that's why the old hymn writer says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And the thing I need somebody to know is that if you're going to fight a spiritual battle, you've got to make sure you fight with the right weapons. Are y'all hearing the pastor today? And in fact, let me say it this way, uh, my oldest son, he's about to be 14 next month. And, and so, Dr. Pollard, man, these one-on-one games are getting closer and closer in the driveway. And, and so, earlier this week, we're playing one-on-one in the gym. And, and because I'm feeling kind of good, I'm playing the wrong game, Albie. I'm out there crossing over and shooting jump shots. And before I knew it, he was up six to three, and we were going to seven. And so, then I came to myself like the prodigal. And say, why am I out here on the perimeter? I got a post game where, like most dads, I backed him down in the paint where I knew I wasn't going to miss the shot. And it's crazy because he got mad. He said I was cheating. He said, Daddy, I dare you to shoot from the outside. And the reason he wanted me to go outside was because he wanted me to play his game. And I had to say to him, son, that when you're playing an opponent, if they can't stop what you're doing, then never stop what you're doing. Y'all not with me today. And and what I'm saying today, saints, is that when you pray, you're backing the devil into the post. When you pray, you're putting him in the paint where he can't stop you. And that's why Paul says you ought to pray without ceasing. And it was his way of saying that if the devil can't stop what you do, then don't stop what you're doing. You can't play his game. You've got to stay down low and call on the name of the Lord. Are you hearing me today, friends? And so now, as we go quickly back to the book of Nehemiah, I want you to understand that Nehemiah, my friends, has a very unique historical context. Now, remember, friends, that God had, because of the children of Israel's wickedness, God allowed them to suffer a prophesied 70 years of exile where they would be taken captive by the Chaldeans. And understand that some were held captive captive in Babylon. Some were left in distress in Jerusalem, while many were scattered amongst the nations. And at this point, the head of gold Babylon has been supplanted by the chests and arms of silver, the Medes and the Persians. And even though the exile is complete, there are still some Jews that serve Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, and Nehemiah is one. And here in chapter 1, friends, we find a very burdened Nehemiah who's just gotten word that the gates of Jerusalem have been torn down and that the walls have been burned with fire. Now, in coming weeks, we're going to see Nehemiah and his friends partake in some very heroic and bold actions. In fact, the problem is that when we preach Nehemiah, often we run right to chapter 2 when he makes 
his request to the king, but the miracle takes place in chapter 1 when he makes his request before the Lord. In fact, there is nothing good that happens in chapter 2, chapter 5, or chapter 7 if Nehemiah does not fall on his face before God. Now, there are a few things that I like about Nehemiah's journey. Are y'all still with me today, church? But the first thing I like about Nehemiah is that he teaches, number one, that your prayers should always precede your actions. Okay, let, let, me, let me say it one more time. That, that in the journey of faith, that your prayers ought to always precede your actions. And, and let me just give you this warning, that you can run past this at your own peril, and you can ignore it at your own demise. You see, friends, too often the order of life gets inverted whenever we are facing a challenge or a conundrum, whenever tensions begin to mount, whenever frustrations begin begin to rise, whenever enemies begin to multiply, what we tend to do is act first and then pray when our actions fail or bring defeat. But the reason I like Nehemiah is that he prays before he acts. He prays as he acts. And God blesses every action that he does because his actions are bathed in the power of prayer. And see, this is the motif for this word, that too often our lives are filled with more re our impulsive reactions then there are prayerful responses. Let me say it again. The problem is we've got too many impulsive reactions and not enough prayerful responses. You see, sometimes, man, when it gets a little hot or tense, there is this feeling that we've got to do it ourselves, that we've got to bring it to pass, that we've got to do things on our own. And what happens is we forfeit the divine power that God alone is able to produce. And this, friends, is why the believer must have a pray first mentality. Because Proverbs 14, 12 says there is a way that seems right, but the end is the way of death. And so if Proverbs is accurate, it means that my first response, that my initial impulse, that my primary reaction is probably the wrong one. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? You see, sometimes that initial, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. I need us to be clear that sometimes your initial problem is made 10 times worse by your initial reaction. In fact, friends, I need you to understand that sometimes your reaction can be so catastrophic that you can't even pray for God to fix the problem because you need God to repair the damage that your reaction caused. In fact, can I pause to say that many times we're not defeated by the devil's action, we're sunk by our own reaction. In other words, we can't even pray for God to take us to that next level because our reaction digs such a deep hole that now we got to pray for God just to get us back to ground zero. In fact, friends, I need you to think back on this for just a moment. How many income outcomes could have been radically different if we had just taken the moment to be still and allow God to give us instruction before we act? Are y'all hearing the pastor this afternoon? In fact, how would the atmosphere of home be different this week if when your spouse came at you the wrong way, if you had taken a moment to pray before you reacted? How different would things be on that job if you had taken the time to pray before you took the job or left the job? How different would things be with your kids if you took the time to pray before you decided to punish or not punish? In fact, you could have saved some apologies if you had prayed before you hit send on that email, on that text, or on that social media post. Are y'all hearing me, church? And see, I need somebody to understand that one of Satan's greatest weapons is false urgency. 
In other words, false urgency is that innate belief that I have to respond or react or do something right away. And friends, this is how the enemy hurries us and frenzies us so that we act ahead of our prayers and our petitions. And one of the things that you've got to do, friends, is you've got to resist the urge to respond to false urgency. Are y'all with me today, church? In fact, friends of mine, I need you to know that if they, uh, they offer you the job today uh, and they need an answer today, it's probably because you're the second or third choice. And sometimes you need to be still before God before you make a permanent decision. Can I suggest to somebody today that sometimes before you press sin, you need to be still and allow God to give you grace to be able to communicate in a language that is seasoned with salt. I know somebody is in a place where the relationship is getting serious and you don't want to keep somebody uh, uh, strung along, but you better make sure that you move into a season of prayer before you move into a season of matrimony. And I know that there is this sense that I got to do something right away, but I'm at a place where I've been burned so many times, hurt by decisions I didn't pray about, that I would rather wait on God than to be hurried by people. And see, and this is why Proverbs 14 says it this way, there is a way uh, that seems right unto a man, but the end of that way is the way uh, of death. No, duh, there is a way that seems right. But the Bible says there is a way that looks good, it makes sense, but that way culminates in death. And, and essentially what the Bible is saying is that sometimes the visible way is not the ordained way. And in other words, what God is saying is that sometimes that way that looks like it makes sense, the, the way that aligns with human logic is not necessarily the way that God has intended for you to take. Let me just say to somebody who feels like they are paint painted into a corner by circumstance, I need you to know that there are going to always be a visible way, but then there are several other ways that you can't access until you call upon God in prayer. See, see, one of the things that the enemy has this very acute way of doing is causing you to choose from one of are, are, are causing you to choose from a place where you think you only have one option. You see, one of the things that can happen, friends, is we can get so angry, we can get so frustrated, we can be so lonely, we can be so desperate that the enemy creates a myopic vision or worldview, and what he does is he limits your perspective so that you can only see one option. And I need somebody to know that the visible way is not the only way. So that the visible way may be divorce, but that's not the only way. The visible way may be cursing them out, but that's not the only way. The visible way may be to quit and walk away, but that's not the only way. That the visible way may be to just give up and go back the way you came, but that's not the only way. And the thing I need somebody to get is that the visible way is not the only way. I love what Ellen White says. She says that God has a thousand ways of pro providing for his children that you know not of. This is the point of rejoicing to somebody today. You don't have to choose from the bottom of the barrel. You don't have to take whatever is in front of you. I need somebody to know that you've got options in Jesus Christ, and if you just call upon God, God will make a way in the desert. In fact, he'll make a way out of no way. I need you to know you've got more than one dating option. There's more than one financial option. There's more than one medical option. There's more than one professional option. God has ways that you cannot see, but you can't see the alternative route until you call on the name of God. Are you hearing me today, friends? Second thing that this story teaches us quickly is that you don't have to wait on God to give you strength to pray. 
you get strength when you pray. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. No, 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 you don't have to wait on strength to pray. You actually get strength when you pray. In, in fact, put this quote up here from Prophets and Kings 629. Look at this. I want you to see what she says about Nehemiah. She says, as Nehemiah prayed, his faith and courage drew, grew strong. Oh, y'all didn't catch it. As he prayed, his faith and courage drew strong. His mouth was filled with holy argument. He pointed to the dishonor that would be cast uh, upon God if his people, now that they had returned to him, should be left in weakness and oppression. And he urged the Lord to bring to pass his promise. Nehemiah had often poured out his soul in behalf of his people, but now as he prayed, holy purpose formed in his mind. Now notice what she says at the beginning. As he prayed... His faith and courage drew strong. Now, now I hope that, that somebody's getting this. That, that, that Ellen White literally says that as Nehemiah prays, his faith and his courage get stronger. Okay, God, I need to preach out of town. Y'all not here with me today. In, in other words, friends, I need y'all to understand, he, she's not saying that he had great strength when he went into his prayer closet. He got great strength from his prayer closet. In other words, the Bible lets us know that when he first started to pray, that Nehemiah was a weeping and grieving bucket of tears, that his soul was disquieted within him when he found out that the walls had been broken down and that the gates had been burned with fire. But she literally says that as he prays, his faith begins to swell, his courage begins to increase. That man's strong petition forms in his mind. In other words, man, we waiting for strength to get into the secret place. But I need you to know when you go into the secret place, do I have seven or eight folk that's ever gone weak into the secret place? You didn't have strength when you went in, but man, you had something on you that when you came out, it caused the forces of hell to fall back off a child of God. And see, the reason this is critical is because Nehemiah does not go into the prayer closet, man, with this rotund faith and these huge convictions. I need you to get that there is a process that takes place, that the more he prays, the more his courage begins to develop, the more his strength is maintained. See, I need somebody to understand that strength is not a prerequisite for prayer. Strength is the result of prayer. See, we've created unwittingly this faulty narrative that says, man, only the strong have the ability to pray. But the reason somebody gets strong is not because they had the ability before they prayed, but they got the ability once they begin the habit of calling on the name of the Lord. See, see, some of us, our problem is we try to pre treat prayer like some people treat going to the gym. You know how like sometimes you don't really want to go in the gym because you see all these people already in great shape. And so there's almost a part of you that says, I need to get in shape just so I can go to the gym. But you don't get in shape to go to the gym. You get in shape by going to the gym. And the reason those who are in the gym are in shape is because they go to the gym. Oh, y'all not hearing me today. In other words, you don't get strong to go to God. You get strong by going to God. He is your strength and your portion. And see, I want to talk to that soul today that feels like you're too weak to pray, that you're too uh, 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 meager to be able to pray, that you don't have the courage to be able to pray. I need somebody to understand that you've got to get to a place where you pray in a principled fashion. And when you pray in a principled way, it means that I am going to summon a strength from within. I'm not going to wait for a feeling that comes from without. How many of us know that if you're waiting on a feeling to start praying? Okay, y'all not going to keep it real with me today. How many of us can keep it real and just say that most days you don't feel like praying? Oh, y'all not going to be honest. 
I, I can, I'm going to tell you, I'm the pastor, and I can admit that I don't wake up in the morning and angels don't fill up my bedroom. A light does not shine from heaven. I do not hear an angelic symphony. There are days where I'm tempted to fall asleep when I pray. There are some times where my mind wonders when I pray. But what I have to do is I have to grab my thoughts. And I have to secure my spirit, and I have to pray past my feelings. I can't wait on those feelings. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, friends? So you got to pray regardless of the circumstance, and you'll find strength in the secret place. And let me just say to somebody who's still wrestling with this idea, because you're saying, man, I don't have strength to pray. I don't have the mind to pray. See, it's because... You have a wrong interpretation of what strength looks like. How many of us understand that the strength to pray is found in the burden you carry? See, you thought the burden was taking away strength. No, but your burden is actually the strength that you need to settle in the secret place and call on the name of the Lord. In other words, the strength to pray for your kids is in the burden you have for your kids. The strength you pray for your marriage is in the burden you have for your marriage. The strength to pray for Oakwood is in the burden you have for Oakwood. The strength to pray for the sick is found in your burden for the sick. In other words, you don't have to wait for it to come like a cool breeze, but wherever you have burden, you find access to God in prayer. In other words, your burden ought not push you away from God. They actually usher you to the throne. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, friends? And see, this is why, friends, I need us to know that even when you don't feel it, you got to pray. When you don't see nothing happening, you still got to pray. When you don't see no momentum, you still got to call on the name of the Lord because, see, I need you to know that when you don't, you forfeit one of the most powerful promises in Philippians chapter 4 where it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with, make your, uh, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Watch this, church. I need you to realize that before God changes things, God changes you. He changes your disposition. He changes your spirit. He replaces your distress with peace. He changes your chaos with order. Before he changes stuff outside of you, he's got to make a change inside of you. Now, notice what the promise is because I need you to know that God takes a while to change things. But you know what can be changed as soon as you get off your knees? Your spirit can be changed. Your soul can, can be secured. You can have the peace of God, oh, that the Word says is so great that it passes human understanding so that when you go through what you go through and you don't respond like folk think you ought to respond, they thought you were going to be out of your mind. They thought you wouldn't make it through what you've gone through. They anticipated your collapse and your demise. But when they see you walking around and your head is held high and you're wrapped tight in your mind and you're not a bucket of tears, they can't explain it. They think you're getting drunk, that you're on Prozac, that you're in denial. It's just the peace of God that is securing me in the face of adversity. And see, something, one of the things I say all the time, I need you to understand that prayer and peace play on the seesaw together. Oh, y'all missed it. So the Bible says, the more I pray, the more peace I'm going to have. Y'all know when you're on the seesaw, when you mash down on one side, it raises up the other side. So the deeper I go down in prayer, guess what? The more my peace begins to increase. 
So the more you go down, oh, y'all not hearing me, the more your peace goes up. But the more I stand up, the more my peace goes down. And I'm looking for a church who's going to stay down on your knees so that your peace can go up, your strength can go up, your help can increase. It's like the old song says, it's hard to stumble when you're on your knees. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Second thing I want to say quickly is that things should not change faster than you do. <laughs> Prayer changes things. But those things should not change faster than the one praying. All right. Have you noticed that Nehemiah's prayer is actually filled with more repentance than requesting? It is filled with more contrition than the collecting of things. Are y'all catching this today, friends? So that when you look at Nehemiah's prayer, it's not him coming before God and saying, God, give me this and give me that and give me the other. I want, I want, I need, I need. His man prayer is actually fueled with this sense of remorse where he literally talks about how he sinned, how my father's house have sinned, how the generations have sinned against you, how we've done wickedness and how we have abandoned your commandments. And see, there is a particular movement behind the way that Nehemiah prays because Nehemiah understands that it was their unwillingness to repent that was the cause of the exile. And if they, God concludes the exile, but there is no repentance, there is going to be a revisiting of the judgments of Babylon by another nation. See, the, the heaviness of this moment brings Nehemiah to a place of complete and utter despair. Understand that the reason Nehemiah fuels this prayer with repentance is because even if God changes their outward circumstances without changing their inner disposition, that disposition is going to wield those same circumstances back into reality. So that if God changes their financial posture and their legislative posture, and their political posture without amending their spiritual posture, I need you to know life will have this cyclical nature to it, and instead of Babylon, it's going to be somebody else. See, see, I don't know if we're quite getting why Nehemiah prays this prayer of repentance and with weeping and grief. It's crazy because they've been in exile for 70 years. So it's strange to me why Nehemiah breaks down and cries when he hears that the gates have been burned and the walls have been torn down. Like, in other words, that should have been given. They have been taken by siege and taken from their country over 70 years ago. Why is Nehemiah now weeping about broken walls and burned gates? That should have been an assumption. That's what happens whenever one country absorbs another country. But understand, there is something about the visual that is communicated that communicates a more deeper and powerful truth because the broken down walls and the burned gates are simply an outward reflection of Israel's spiritual condition. And Nehemiah understands that if God changes outward structures before he rebuilds the inner structure of the people. See, this, see, this is the tension that someone is living in right now in this moment because, man, you're frustrated because prayer hasn't changed things. But do you realize that that thing was sent to change you? We're, we're wanting God to change this uncomfortable thing. But that uncomfortable thing was sent to create a character stirring and agitation that was to bring about a permanent change in your soul disposition. And see, God understands this, that if God makes bad circumstances good without making bad character good, then bad character becomes permanent. You see, sometimes we 
mismanage the narrative. Ooh, y'all quiet in church today. Oh, don't look at your watch. Look at me. I'm right here. Amen. Amen. <laughs> See, this is one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm starting to wrestle with in my mind. Because we say, man, that God takes a long time to change things. Well, Psalm 46 says that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. And I guess my question is, does God take a long time to change things, or do we just take a long time to change is the issue how slow God is to move, or is the issue how slow we are to adjust to the chastening, buffeting circumstances of life that are designed to drive us back in the direction of our Savior? So sometimes God doesn't change that irritating circumstance. Because he knows that if he changes the placement of the circumstance before he changes the placement of your character, then your character is going to get set in stone or cemented in something that has you on the outside of the city looking in when the earth is made new. And this is why Nehemiah says, man, we got to repent. Now that word repent, it ain't nothing but a fancy church word. It simply means to turn around and turn away from. It, is, it means that we've got to turn in the direction of Jesus Christ. And see, this thing I like about Nehemiah, and this is why I need the church to really kind of embrace the principle. Notice that Nehemiah doesn't do a bunch of asking. He doesn't ask, the, he doesn't ask God for bricks and straw and mortar. He just says, Lord, we're sorry. He just says, Lord, we acknowledge what we have done. Because Nehemiah understands this, that if they are able to repent, they don't even have to ask God for a whole lot of things. Why? Because God's designs for them are greater than what they can even ask for or think. God God said to them in the prophet Jeremiah, he says I, 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 that I have plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. And see, the problem is we want to request without repenting. But if you repent, I need you to know that God will give you 10 times more than what you can ever request. Is anybody realize that we serve the God of Ephesians 3.20 that says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly abundantly above all you can ask or think, but you've got to put some repentance before you're requesting. See, it's crazy because, see, we want to put the cart before the horse and wonder why we can't make any motion or traction. Man, it's just like I remember one time, you know, we were, we were in the house and and, and, you know, there was some food that had been in the fridge too long, and one of the kids put it inside of the trash can. And after a while, it began to give off a bad odor throughout the house. And, and it's crazy because, like, once everybody smelled the bad odor, you know what their initial response was to do? Was to get air freshener and spray it all over the house. But how many of us understand that air freshener only lasts for a few minutes? See, 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 air freshener won't kill the stench. It just masks it for a little while. And see, those that make requests without repentance, all they do is mask the stench. But God is saying to somebody, you got to take out the trash in your life. You got to get rid of the garbage and stop masking the things that you don't want to address. So that if God changes your finances without addressing your stewardship, He's just masking the inevitable. If God changes your health status without you changing your health practices, we're just masking the inevitable. If God changes the condition of the marriage if without changing your posture and the way you talk down to your spouse, it is just a masking of the inevitable. And what I'm saying to somebody today is that God does not function on the level of your image, that God is functioning on the level of your character. See, how many of us, see, we're grateful that we serve a God who saves, but we don't rejoice over the God who sanctifies. See, we just want the God that just expunges the record. We just want the God that wipes away the strain. But I need a God that doesn't just make me new in heaven. I want a God that's going to do a work so powerful in me on earth 
that what he says about me in heaven becomes true in my walk on earth. So he doesn't just say I'm righteous up there, but it can be said about me as I walk down here. But I need you to know that character growth will not always be done voluntarily. Come on and say amen, church. God has to choose for us the first. That's why through Isaiah he says, I have chosen for you the furnace of affliction. Man, I'd be like, God, I wish I could grow, man, in, in a space of extreme comfort. I wish character grew when you just had millions in the bank. Come on and say amen. I just wish, man, that man, I became more prayerful the more nice things people said about me. I wish I became more diligent the more friends I have. But how many of us can tell the truth? That's not where we grow. I love how y'all looking at me right now. I mean, come on. Like, it is when you are so broke you can't pay attention that you stop praying rehearsed prayers and you start praying like Nehemiah. It is when your enemies seem like they're going to overcome you that you begin seeking God with a different level of intentionality. And see, I need you to know that God will never allow you to be swallowed up. He'll never allow you to be overwhelmed. He'll never allow you to be burned by the fire. But he's going to tailor the fire. He's going to tailor the heat so that it removes the dross and the impurities so that it fixes in place heavenly properties that God is able to use for his glory. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Listen, I'm almost done. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Look at it with me real quick. Nehemiah 1, verse 8. The word says this, remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, ooh, Jesus, <laughs> just, it's so good. Remember, I pray the word that I commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the nations. But if you return to me, keep my commandments and do them. Though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens. Are y'all catching this, church? Yet I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Last thing I need somebody to know is that no matter how far you get from God, God always leaves the light on for his people. Chris, I read this and my soul almost exploded. Because what Nehemiah is praying is the promise that God made to Moses in Deuteronomy 31. And it shows something powerful about God's grace. That grace is never reactionary. Grace is always preemptive. So notice what God says. He says literally that, man, if you all stray... He says, I'm going to scatter you to the furthest parts of the earth. But notice what he says, that if you ever return and keep my commandments, I'm going to leave the light of grace on so that you can always find your way back home. In other words, I need somebody to understand that the grace of God, it is not a permissiveness of sin, but it is God's acknowledgement of your sinful nature. It is an expression of his great love where God says, I don't want you to sin, but guess what? I understand who you are. I understand how fallen you must be so that even when you do, no God, <laughs> He didn't say, if you do it. He says, when you do it. I want you to know that even before you sin, before you stray, I want you to know that even when you get far from me, and even when you're using my breath to do your dirt, I want you to know that no matter how far you get from me, I'll always
always leave the light on so that you can find your way back home. See, it's just kind of like this. Those of us have small kids. I remember there'd be times where on, 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 you know, on Sabbath, you go to somebody's house, and there'd be times where I would have to make two or three stops one Sabbath afternoon. And so, man, if, man, you know, I would tell the kids, you know, that, that you know, if you go in here, and you know how you have to do as parents, you got you to gotta threaten them. You got to say, act like you got some sense. Come on, your parents ever told you, act like you got home training. Come on and say Amen. And I be telling man, don't you be out there in the backyard. Don't you be crawling all over the floor. Don't get your church clothes dirty. Now, I give them that instruction, and I expect them to do it. But guess what? You know your kids. So I know that if I'm going to a house where there are going to be other kids, guess what? I'm going to bring a change of clothes because I know they're going to get dirty. Y'all missed it. In other words, I'm not giving them permission to get dirty, but I just love them so much that I can't take them to the next place still soiled. I got to put some clean clothes over them and cover their stains. And what I'm saying is what John said. He says, I write these things that you do not sin. But the good news is that if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And see, I need somebody to understand that the grace of God is never reactionary. It is always preemptive. So I need you to understand that even Jesus was not a reaction to Adam's sin. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit, the father didn't say, Jesus, what you want to do about it? See, I need you to know that the plan of salvation was not a reaction to man's lostness. The plan of salvation was a part of the original design. The plan of this salvation was laid before the earth was framed or gravity put in place. It is why when John in Revelation 13, 8 sees Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth so that before he created the world, he created a plan of redemption because grace is not a reaction. It is preemptive, and God always has you in mind. Can the church say amen today? Listen, go ahead and play something. And I'm saying this because there is somebody today that just feels too far from God. See, the reason God told them this in Deuteronomy 31 before they strayed is he knows this is man's innate nature. He knew what was going to happen to them would be the same thing that happened to Adam and Eve once they ate the fruit. You see, once they ate the, ate, ate the fruit, they didn't come to God and say, Lord, we messed up. You know what they did? You know what sin did? It is it caused them to run and hide from God. And force them to try to self-cover. And see, this is something I need somebody to understand about sin. Is that sin doesn't make God hate us. Sin makes us uncomfortable with God. And he knows that when you get far from God, the accuser has this way of overwhelming you with the echoes of what you did wrong. To convince you that you've done so much and you've gone so far and you've messed up so many times that, man, God ain't even fooling with you no more. But God says, I don't wait until you're a finished product to call you. I call you while you're still under construction. I need somebody to understand that when the Spirit of God began to woo you and draw you into a relationship with Him, I need you to know that God understood and He in His foreknowledge. You know, God knows the beginning from the end and He knows the end from the beginning. So do you realize that when God called you, He knew every sin you would... He knew every sin you would ever commit. And He factored it into His calculus. And He says, you know what? I still want you. I'm still calling you, and I'm still going to use you for my glory. 
And the word to somebody today who's just feeling far from God, who's feeling like I can't pray, who's feeling like I don't have the strength to pray, I need you to know the word simply says this, at the moment you return, the moment you turn around and make a covenant to operate according to my commandments, my laws, and my statutes, I need you to know that he says that I only am I going to gather you from the furthest places of the earth. I'm going to bring you back to the place where I made a covenant with your father where you will be able to operate in harmony with me. And see, friends of mine, I just need somebody to know it doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter how long you've been there. We serve the God that while the door of probation is still open, he says, man, like your boy Tom Bodell on those Motel 6 commercials, he says, we'll leave the light on for you. I'm going to illuminate the path so that you can always find your way back home. So he says, yeah, you're going to be scattered. There's going to be some disruption. But while there is yet time, you can always return. I want somebody to process what's happening in your life. Because you're frustrated because God hasn't changed the difficult thing. That's not really the issue. The issue is that there are certain things that have yet to create the change in you. And if God changes the thing before you begin to change the character, guess what, man? You will get so settled and cemented in it that salvation then at that point becomes a difficult thing for God to accomplish. I want somebody to understand that you don't get strength to start praying. You get strength once you start praying. In the coming weeks, we're going to look at some stuff that God does through Nehemiah, but I need you to know that the basis is set right here in chapter 1 where he begins to call on the name of the Lord. And the same is true for you, man. God is going to take you places. He's going to open doors. He's going to cause you to ride on the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob. But I need you to know it does not begin with your actions. It begins with your prayer. I need you to know that you enter the construction zone, not standing on two feet, but you enter the construction zone on your knees. Hallelujah. How many know when you pray? When you pray, everything be all right. will be all right. When you say everything will work out will fine. Work out fine. Just have faith. It says when you pray. When when you need a friend. Oh, when you need a friend. It says, just have faith. Just have faith. Just have faith. It says, when you pray. When you pray. Hallelujah. How I many know when you call him, he'll answer your prayer. He'll be right there. Hallelujah. Let's sing it together. When you call him. When, when you call him. When you pray, when you pray, when you need a friend, it says, Oh, when you need oh, a friend, oh, when you need a friend, it says, Just have faith when you pray, just have faith. to him it says amazing grace amazing grace 
says, How sweet, how sweet the sound, the sound that saved the wretch. We pray to that amazed God when you pray. standing to our feet. God is wanting to move all of us into a construction zone. Nehemiah and his cohorts, they began a journey of rebuilding physical walls. There are many of us that need to begin a journey of rebuilding. Some of us need a spiritual rebuild. Some of our spiritual great gates have been burned down and destroyed. Some of us need to rebuild walls of faith. Some of us need a relational rebuild with children, siblings, coworkers, or friends. Some of us may need a financial rebuild. God is able. Some of us may need a professional rebuild. He's willing to do it. God wants to take you into the construction zone. But I hope you heard what I just said. You don't go into the construction zone standing up. Like Nehemiah, you enter into the construction zone on your knees. And Oakwood Church to the Oakwood community, if we were to realize all of our potential, if we are to become all that God has ordained us to be, there's just got to be a radical return and commitment to a fierce calling on the name of the Lord. Individually, corporately. Listen, we got to get out of this, this habit where we act and then we start praying once the actions bring calamity to our lives. No, we got to call on God first and second and third. And then we just got to learn how to push, pray until something happens. Yes. I need somebody to, to reinterpret the data. You think, man, that God is slow to change things. No, you're just slow to repent. Slow to turn away. Some of us are holding on too tightly as Dr. Johnson says, we got to hold on loosely to some things, to some people, some ideas. I need some young person to understand that God is your help. He is your strength. He is your portion. And that you ought never be operating autonomously or separately from him. Listen, that word was just what I needed. I hope it was what you needed. I'm hoping that you're taking the prayer challenge to make sure you add at least five minutes a day to your prayer journey this week. You're going to see doors open. You're going to see miracles happen. More than that, you're going to grow in your inner person. So listen, if this helped you, just do one favor. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and share it with somebody else that needs to be blessed.
Listen, you have a good one. I look forward to seeing you next week in the Construction Zone.